So this morning I'll read a, a bigger chunk in context, and we're still in chapter one. And then I'll focus on just the few verses at the end of it. So we'll start in verse three of 1 Peter chapter one this morning. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, prepare your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy Amen. Wow. Remember who Peter is writing to, the context. Historically, believers who are being persecuted around 64 to 67 AD, 60 to 67, if you want a broader date range. Peter is writing to believers who are being persecuted by the new Babylon, which is Rome. Now, they're losing their homes and possessions, their friends, their finances. Some of them are fleeing for their lives, only grabbing what they could carry in their hands. This is the scene you have to understand to whom Peter is writing to. Now today, we don't have that much pressure, obviously in the physical. We're not being driven out of our homes, and I'll say yet, because I believe that will happen one day. We don't want it to, but it's just a reality that we're going to have to face here in America. Other places, they are being driven out of their homes. But we are still being attacked mainly in our minds, even as I am this morning, as I'm speaking, we're being attacked to remove us from this hope that Peter is presenting in these deep theological uh, sections of scripture. And Peter is telling the church, you have to focus on this hope, and we have that that living hope, those two words that, we, I mean, we, we make Christian songs out of them, worship songs, but it's really important because we have an enemy who is out to get our minds away from that hope. 
And it's up to us, and Peter's telling these believers in verses 13 through 16, it's all about mind control, really. This is what it's about. Because we have an enemy to contend with until Jesus comes. This tension is going to continue. It's waiting for you outside of these doors. For some, it's actually happening in this room right now. One day Jesus will return and make it all right. So from verses 1 to 12, Peter's describing the hope, the salvation that we have, the testing of our faith. Of course, we've talked about that already. Meaning if we truly trust in Christ, even through trials, the outcome of our continually trusting God, not the the measure or the level of our faith that we work up, right? The outcome of us placing our hope, our trust in God, is the salvation of our souls. Well, you say, I'm already saved. Well, you're saved and being saved. You're not completely saved yet. You understand. One day, everything. You're going to be totally saved. So the salvation we have and the gospel that's being preached to us, Peter is saying, it's so incredible that angels, they desire to look into these things. What's happening in this church is amazing to angels. What happens when you present the gospel to someone or share your testimony or share the hope, the reason for the hope that is within you? Angels long to look into those things. So it's because of this hope, the word in the Greek is the elpizo, and it, it means the desire of some good with the expectation of obtaining it. That's all it means. Peter's talking about that hope for 12, uh, 12 verses, and now he comes to verse 13, and it's therefore. So therefore is very important conjunction. That being said, or for that reason. Saying, so because of all this, what I've just told you, so if you guys just open your Bible and put your finger somewhere and say, Lord, speak to me, which I don't necessarily recommend if you're, you know, studying properly. I, can't, I won't say God can't do that. But, and you come to a therefore, you had better read up on what came before it because it's very important. For this reason, this is what we must do because of the hope that's within us, because of the fact that we call ourselves, as we did it, we declared this morning that we're children of God. We have to do this. These are commands. Number one is prepare our minds or gird up the loins of our minds. So our multiple words for Many translations say gird up the loins of your mind. I actually like that better because it relates to how they were reading it at the time. You could change it to prepare your minds for action. It's the same thing. But really, that phrase is one word in the Greek. And it's the anazonumi. And it means to gird up. And you'll see the definition back there, but it's from... From only, only in 1 Peter 1.13, it's applied to the mind being held in constant preparation. The mind being held in constant preparation for a believer. It's taken from the custom of the Eastern nations who, when they had occasion to extend themselves, like journeying or running, they had to bind up the long flowing garments by a girdle or a belt around their hips, and men preparing for battle, something like this. It's not awkward. Yes, it is. But <laughs> that tunic won't allow you to do heavy labor or fight in battle. You gotta, you have to, you'll be hindered by all those, you know, we don't wear robes anymore. So um, I'm sure people will at the end of next month for whatever reason, but we don't wear robes anymore. Um, Loose clothes 
going to get in the way. Very simple application. We have loose thoughts that are running rampant through our minds, even at the moment, even as I'm speaking to you. And they need to be, and they're able to be, brought under control by the Spirit of Christ. This is an ability you do not have before you are saved. So congratulations, you have superpowers when you're in Jesus. Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you, which also is in Christ Jesus. So in the world, without Christ, or if we are drawn, if we, if we were drifting off into the world, you're just controlled by every thought that, that comes to your mind. And I'll explain what that actually means. So as believers now, we're, we're commanded to take the initiative to prepare our minds, which is our hearts. You understand that your heart is just a, a beating muscle. And when the Bible speaks of your heart, it's actually talking about your mind. That is the seat of your affections. It's the seat of the desires of your heart, your will, all of that, your personality, everything. It's all going on in there. We have to take this initiative. Nobody's going to do it for you. In order to live a life of holiness, which is what Peter brilliantly gets to at the end. And holiness just means being set apart for the master's use. That's what you're called to be. That's why you're called to be holy. You're called to be set apart for the master's use. In everything, yes, in everything. What does that mean? Well, let's unpack this first. If you don't take control of your thoughts, they will control you. If you do not take control of your thoughts, they will control you. So whether you like it or not, you just can't allow your conscious thoughts to go wherever they want to go. Any impulse, any concern or care, any desire or attraction, any temptation or obsession. It is often a mess in here, in your mind. Our minds, our brains are actually way too much for us to even figure out. Do you know what organ of the body there is the least known about in science and in, in biology and all that? The brain. Absolutely. You can Google it. It'll come up right away. Okay, well, I, I got the mind. So the brain is the part of the body there is the least known about. Um, that's what research shows. How can we control our thoughts when we have so many? Experts estimate that the, the human mind thinks between 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day. 2,500 to 3,500 thoughts per hour. I can understand that for my wife, but I didn't think I had that many thoughts a day. <laughs> Apparently so. <laughs> She's thinking all the time. It's like boom, boom, boom. Um, that's a lot of brain activity. How are you going to handle that? There's a crazy amount of processing going on in here, and we are only aware of a portion of it. There are, I, I think there's thousands, if not millions, of neurotransmitters in the brain. We only know about like 10. There's, we don't even know about it all. It's, just a, it's, it's a mystery. So according to neuroscientists, now your mind's going to be blown ironically enough. We're, we're conscious, which means we're aware of only 5% of our cognitive activity. So most of our decisions, our actions, and our emotions, it's depending on 95% of brain activity that goes beyond our conscious awareness. It's happening right now. The beating of your heart, 
the rhythm of your breathing, the blinking of your eyes. As I was preparing, I, I, I tried to be like, okay, I'm going to be aware of my heartbeat. Well, I got bored with that, so. Um, <laughs> then I tried my blinking and my rhythm. That stuff was just happening on, uh, subconsciously, subconscious level. When you're pushing a grocery cart in the store and not smashing it into a, a tower of kitty litter. When you do these things, you're relying on what's called adaptive unconscious, which is all the ways that our brains understand the world that the mind and the body must negotiate. The adaptive unconscious makes it possible for us to say, turn, <laughs> turn a corner in a car without having to go through the elaborate calculations to determine the precise angle of the turn, the velocity of the automobile, the steering radius of, of the car. You're not thinking about all that. It's adaptive unconscious. So we really don't have all the control that we think that we do. We don't control the rhythm of our hearts. Tell your heart to start being slower right now. Tell your eyes, no, no, eyes. I mean, you, you could probably do it for a while, but it's going to fail at some point. Most of what we do every minute of, of every day is unconscious. They say life would be chaos if all of this stuff was in the forefront and you were knowing about it. It would be insane. You wouldn't be able to handle it. So if we think about that, and we're believers, of course, we know God's in control of our heart. He's the one who started it. He started our breath. Just our thinking and our living and our breathing, it's an act of God. And faith, we trust him to not only start our heartbeats and, and blink our eyes, start the process of it, right, and continue to breathe every day, which is a miracle, in cadence, we are evidences of the reality of God Something we see, and not all the scientists understand, not all scientists are, there's many Christian scientists. So, now, we also cannot control all this subconscious, unconscious stuff. We can't control what comes out of that into the conscience. And it's meaning it's coming from unknown to known, and it was ready in your mind. That is why every so often, and if I took a survey that was anonymous, from everyone in this room, and I said, write the, the, the last whacked out thought you've had during the week that just came into your mind out of nowhere, we would be shocked. N nobody wants to talk about it. You get a strange random thought, a strange desire, something in the subconscious comes into the conscience and we become aware. It becomes known. Now, because of this subconscious, conscious studies that these scientists have, guess what? This is why brain science is studied by marketers. This is why you buy stuff. This is why they got most of us. This is why I bought cheese curds yesterday. <coughs> because they look so good in the picture. If they can bypass the conscious mind into the subconscious, there's great influence there. Even to make you buy a product. It is, at its core, a form of mind control. And I can prove it. I probably haven't done this in several years, but that's why you have jingles that are associated with products that you guys remember. I'll give you an example. You finish what I'm going to start. Ready? The best part of waking up. Why do you know that? Did you choose to memorize that? You did not. You did not choose to memorize that song and associate it with coffee, but you did 
because music bypasses the conscious mind and it goes right to your subconscious. And that's why music is so powerful. It's scientifically proven. This isn't crazy stuff. This is just proven. That's why those songs take you back to the old days. That's why when I go to Walgreens, they're playing stuff from the 80s and 90s to target people in their 30s and 40s. Just to get us in, yeah, this feels good. I feel like I'm a kid again. I want to buy stuff. They're usually not playing the most unless it's for a, a younger crowd. They, they study this stuff, guys, and they're really good at it. So you just spend $100 in Walgreens, and you're coming out singing music from your childhood, and you're in a, you're in a happy place. And guess what? So are the advertisers <laughs> and Walgreens. But we cannot control the things that pop up in our minds out of nowhere. We cannot control our unknown thoughts. You can't control something that isn't known. I can't predict what's going to pop in my mind, let's say, in an hour. Go ahead and try it. Try to prevent every subconscious thought that's in your mind coming to the forefront. Can't be done. <clears throat> now, we can control to a point, what is coming into our minds to influence that subconscious. What we allow into our minds, garbage in, garbage out, right? Holy living begins in our minds. Holy living begins in our minds. Proverbs 23, 7, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Yes, we can, we can take that. Yes, it's Proverbs principles, but it, it is true because even out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Matthew 12, 34. So we may not be able to fully control the 95%. I can't erase memories. I can't erase traumatic memories. I can't take care of all that stuff, but we can guard what comes in, and then we can, in Christ, take control of the 5% of our brains that we're conscious of. And that's where we're really getting to today, the decisions we make and how we respond to worldly impulses or leanings or whatever it is, how we react to perceptions or threats, all of that in our conscious mind, in our mental capacity, we have the duty to control this morning. And if we, if we don't, the Bible says we're in danger. So this is not letting our minds roam around. So because of this great salvation, tying it in, who we are in Christ, we can no longer be run by our random emotions and feelings anymore. This is the heartbeat of Babylon. This is the beat. It's, it, to me, it's a, like a club beat calling me into a club that I have no business going into because I'm going to get stuck in there and I'm in big trouble. It is luring us in. We have the mind of Christ to guide us. Now, this doesn't only mean, this doesn't only mean the lust of the flesh, right, and giving in to vain desires, but even how we respond, how we respond to life in general. Much of it comes from the subconscious level. Our insecurities, our daddy or mommy issues, the stuff that's happened in our past, our memories, our failures, our fears of failures. And Christ gives us a new heart, a new mind. Yeah, to respond in a new way to everything. So this is exciting news. But this is why... Many believers, they fail to do this, and they fail to walk in it, or worst is, they only do it on Sunday mornings, and they're way out of practice. And during the week, their minds are just running amok with a tangled web of insanity. And then they come to church, and they come to an altar call, and the pastor, perhaps, like I do, I always pray over the mind, because I know that's... That's where everything happens. 
The pastor prays over them. They get a powerful touch from God. Boom, right back out because they refuse to discipline their thought life. They thought it was autopilot when the Bible tells us, hey, gird up the loins of your mind. They struggle when they have, we have the authority to control how we respond, how we react to things, how we perceive things. And like I said, nobody's going to do this for you. So if you don't do it in Christ, in Christ, because of the hope that you have, no one's going to do it for you. And you're, you can have a messed up day pretty quick. It just happened to me last week. I'll talk about it. So, and this, this happens every once in a while, okay? A lady called me, and she said that she would no longer be coming to this church. She was kind, she was kind, but it was, it was criticism masked in kindness because she gently explained that she was gonna go to a church that, you know, there was a pastor who was, more educated and who preached less le length of time than I did. Um, but she said she appreciate, appreciated me very much. So she, she, and I'm thinking, why did I pick up the phone? <laughs> why don't I do this right now? But, but in that moment, in that moment on this phone call, which it, it's going to happen, I had a choice. I had a choice how to respond. I chose to respond in love. I thanked her for coming for the brief time that she came, and I, and I said, and I, I made sure I meant it, I meant it in here, I'm like, God, search my heart, you, I'm glad you found a church that is going to be able to pour into you, and that, that, you know, suits what you're needing right now at, at your time, so, now, if, if I let my thoughts go, folks, my whole, my whole week could have been ruined, my whole day, my family life, everything, just from that one moment of discouragement where maybe she didn't know consciously, but she was, she was being used as a tool for the enemy to come at me, and I had to choose to respond in that moment. There are more important things than what people think about you, and yeah, yeah, I have, I have, I have to struggle with that a lot in ministry, but there are more important things to set our minds on, the Bible says, even people's opinions of you, even people's critiques of you. So when criticism and persecution comes, whether they're real or perceived, because a lot of times they're perceived, they're just in your mind. They're coming from those subconscious layers of all the, you know, of you back in high school when, um, I'll think about me, when, you know, I was called the, the short chubby kid in high school and they picked on me and everyone's picking on me now. I'm seeing it through that filter and it's just pouring out in there and my whole perception is out of whack. Remember, our perceptions are flawed because they're coming through a messy filter. They're coming through the filter of your own heart, which is your mind, and it's a mess in there, and you're only control of 5%. We choose how to react in the conscious. That's where the battle is. I'll give you another example. Okay. All right. Hey, he's okay. He's okay. <laughs> that was an illustration. He was supposed to do that. So... That's an example, okay? So, that just happened. Corgan just got up and very, I knew he was going to do it in a, I knew he was going to do it in an, in an extreme way because Corgan's extreme. Um, Corgan just, he just got up and jumped out of service. What happened? I don't know. He must have been offended, somebody says. There must have been an emergency, somebody else says. We don't know. Do you know what I'm going to do? Unless it was like a medical thing. I I'm going to choose to believe the best thing. He just had to go to the bathroom really bad. <laughs> okay? Cheese curds. Cheese curds. Cheese curds. Don't eat them. <laughs> and if I'm wrong, oh well. The best thing, believe the best thing, 
unless I absolutely know otherwise. That's actually what the Bible is speaking to us to do. The best thing for me that's not going to affect me ministering to you at this moment is to just believe that Corgan had a very full bladder and he had to go really bad. <laughs> no effect on me whatsoever. Worst thing is to go to the extreme and say, I knew it. He's, he, he, he really doesn't even like us. He doesn't like this church. He's offended. He walked out of here. He's never coming back. And then you walk around in defeat from something that didn't even exist. No matter what pops in your head or what happens to you, you, are, you can effectively in authority choose this day whom you're going to serve in your thought life, believe the best option or the best about people before you assume the worst and open up the doors of an attack in your mind. It's always better to do what the word of God says. It's the best mind control there is. So you have to choose what your mind dwells in. Now, the Bible says something to the effect of uh, you can, uh, is it he who dwells in the shadow of the secret place? Yeah, okay. Dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. So there's safety there. There's safety there. Philippians 4, 8, 9. Here's how we dwell. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of pray, play, praise, dwell on these things, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. 2 Corinthians 10.5, you know this one, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Amen. Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. 1 Corinthians 2, 16, for who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Isaiah 26, 3, the steadfast of mind, you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. That one verse, just in that line, is that whole 16 verses of, of 1 Peter because it's talking about that controlling your thought life in relation to the object of the source is the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. You have to prepare your own mind. Not only be careful what you let in, and we'll get to that, but be careful what you dwell on. Even if somebody ousts you, I mean, even if he did walk out because he was just, you know, super offended, dwell on the hope that you have in Christ. It's very simple. Dwell on the salvation that you have in Jesus Christ. Don't dwell on an offense or how they didn't respond to your text message or they didn't like your social post or the myriad of other things that you can be potentially consumed with on a daily basis. Just as we cannot be consumed with our hatred of someone else or a chip on our shoulder or bitterness or, or annoyance or jealousy or envy, all those things that are not in the Philippians verse, that are not, that are opposed to the fruit of the Spirit, they are going to intoxicate you, intoxicate your thought life into the thoughts of the world. So the next thing Peter says is number two, keep sober. Be sober. The word in the Greek for be sober is a nepho. It simply means to be self-controlled in our minds. It, it's more mental stuff. Now, obviously, this does include drugs and alcohol because when you take drugs, street drugs, and alcohol, 
to the intoxicating point, okay? Best not even to, to go there, right? That's, that's, that's my, my stance. But we can be intoxicated with pessimism. We can be intoxicated with judgmentalism. I meet believers who are intoxicated with envy or an over-awareness of their own importance. Everything is about them. Or lack of importance. No self, no value, no worth, anything. We are given over to the thoughts we indulge in. We are given over to the desires we choose in our minds from food, yes, food, and I, it, we laugh about it because it's food and we take it so lightly, but actually, it is a problem. If you ate most of that food out there every day of the week, you're going to have major health problems, and a, a lot of it is, is because of that fleshly desire, so you have to be careful. Nowhere in the Bible says, it's okay to overindulge in the things of the world. Sleep, recreation, sex, shopping, possessions, prosperity, authority, power, money, more is not better. Unless it's more of God. So are you saying we can't have fun? Because I'm, I know I'm talking to some young believers and they're like, what? You're saying I can't do anything? I want to have a good time. I know, I know, I know. Yes, you can have a good time. Yes, you can, yes, you can go to the fair. No, you don't have to go hide in a monastery somewhere. Just not in excess. And we live in a world of excess. Babylon. Remember, it comes from Babel. Babel tower. So we have to be careful not to get drunk over the things of the world. Let, you know what? Let me, let me go against the status quo or the whatever of the world, because this is what the world tells you. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy life. Life is about enjoying ourselves. Go read what Solomon writes about that. Life isn't about enjoying ourselves. It's actually about preparing ourselves. It's about preparing ourselves for a life of enjoyment with Christ forever. In a new body. The more we indulge in our flesh and appetites, we effectively unindulge ourselves from God and his ways. What we feed grows. Teenagers, what you feed grows. It's the same for all of us. It's that two wolves story. You've probably heard it before. It goes way back. There's a good wolf and a bad wolf in your mind. Whichever one you feed more is the one that wins. So you can be a believer and feed the wrong one and still think you're okay. I mean, I'm, you're still a believer, right? Yeah, I'm saved. Okay, okay, well, I'm feeding but that's the way, that's the avenue to being lukewarm. Feed your flesh all week and then you lose your appetite for the things of God. It doesn't work. I, yeah, I've tried it. It doesn't work. Pastor, are you saying you, you were in our immorality that you gave in that? No, that doesn't necessarily mean immorality. You can feed your flesh in other ways. You just waste your time. I don't know. I could play with Legos all day. I love them. I love Legos. I think there's actually some, some good things about building stuff. But anyway, um, nothing spiritual in that. You feed your flesh all week. You lose your appetite for the things of God. And guess what? That's why people stop reading the Bible. Or it becomes a chore. It's like, oh, gosh, I got to read this thing again. Or they feel like they're getting absolutely no fulfillment out of being in a worship service or a church service. Well, maybe you've been feeding the, 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 the wrong wolf all week. We have to cultivate our appetites for the things of God. 
You don't just wake up all day and say, I'm just going to eat green vegetables for the rest of my life, especially if you don't have that taste already in you, that appetite. You have to develop it. And then you'll be like, yeah, okay, vegetables, oh yeah, Brussels sprouts, okay. If I'm not eating them, I'm never going to develop a taste for them. Or some people are like, I'm never eating Brussels sprouts. Like my daughter, she doesn't like Brussels sprouts. We have to cultivate our appetites from God. Or here's what's going to happen. And this is, this is sad. It's you're sitting here or you're involved in a spiritual body. And in reality, in your mind, you'd rather just be home binge watching something on Netflix, eating your favorite brand pint of ice cream, haagen whatever. rather than being in the presence of the king and being touched by his spirit that will touch your heart and change your heart into a heart or a mind set apart for his purposes. And that's why we're talking about holiness. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Does that just mean don't drink alcohol and do drugs? No, this is what it's talking about. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. That's what Peter was talking about before the therefore. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we have to look forward to. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ hey, this world has some cool stuff in it. But what it mainly offers for you, old and young believer. Because you know what? I don't want, I'm not singling out you youth like you're some kind of lost generation because I don't believe that. Because there's people in their 60s and 70s, they're so addicted to Facebook, they can't even get into the presence of God anymore. I'm not saying in this room, I'm just telling you. Okay? Think about it. First thing on your mind, what is the first thing on your mind? That, do you choose the first thing on your mind when you wake up? I, I don't, I can't answer that right now. I don't think you can. I mean, if it's on your mind already, how did you choose it? Whoa, whoa, my mind's blown again. But all this stuff, it's just a veil, young and old people, of a temporary comfort to replace what is really eternal, and that's Jesus Christ. That's why we come to Christ, because something's missing in our lives. Something's not right. And this great salvation we have is in Christ. So we have to prepare our, our minds we have to stay sober. Number two, finally, number three is fix your hope. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, does it say fix your hope kind of? No. It says completely. We have something greater than what the world can even offer or imagine, what any tech can build, what any story can be written about. Beyond, it, it's beyond your concerns about what your friends at school think about you or at your job. You must be concerned with his thoughts towards you, the Father's heart towards you. How does he feel about you today? How does, how does Jesus feel about what you've been thinking about lately? The, the thoughts that you can control. He knows about the ones that you can't control. He's going he's gonna to help you with those when they pop in your mind because he's going to give you power and authority to overcome them. And in that is freedom. And you start to realize, that's not me anymore. I have Christ in me now. Yeah. 
It's beyond what that person did to you in the past. I don't care how bad it is. I don't even want to say I don't care because what good is me saying that? The Bible doesn't care how bad it was in the past. What happened to you? What has happened to you that is so bad that the power of Jesus Christ won't help you overcome it? That the power of Jesus Christ won't help you overcome that hurt? What they spoke over you, what they did to you, how they made you feel. Let it go and forgive or you're gonna be intoxicated with unforgiveness as a believer for the rest of your life. And yes, you will be held accountable because you had the offer. You had the ability to do so. Well, how, pastor? How can I forgive them? Do you know what they did to me? Well, no, I don't know specifically what they did to you. I know, I only know what's happened in my own life. I know, I know what's happened in my wife's life. It's a great example. I'm glad, I'm glad she has that testimony because a man who sits in prison somewhere in Texas who almost murdered her, abused her, beat her, she's forgiven. And I look at that, I'm like, man, Jesus must be pretty powerful. I don't even look at it as her effort because I know her. She knows me. We're really not that strong. It's got to be the power of Christ. What was so bad that you have to continue to hold on to it and allow your mind to be intoxicated? Set your hope on Jesus Christ and what we have not even seen yet, which is the full reality of grace, who we will be in, in, in Christ, his arrival, his second coming. There's nothing comparable to that. That's the blessed hope that we have. It's hope. Don't, it, we don't see it. That's why it's hope. You, it's something great that's going to happen in the future. Don't be deceived in your mind. This isn't all there is. It's, it is. It's kind of like the Clay County Fair. You walk around and you see all the sights and sounds and you smell the smells. But 10 days from now, it's an empty lot. It's over. Wouldn't it be sad if you lived your whole life for those moments, for one passing moment when Jesus offers you so much more? Remember, remember what Peter said leading up to this in 1 Peter 3 through 5. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance uncorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you and you and you and you and all of you who call upon the name of the Lord and who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation that hasn't been revealed yet. It's ready to, it's, it's ready to be revealed in the last time. 1 John 3, 2, beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope, the same hope, purifies himself just as he is pure. That's why we do it. We must stop focusing on the seen realm, on our perceptions, and set our minds on what will come, the living hope we have in Christ when he will be revealed. And the Bible says we're going to be like him? What does that even mean? It means we can walk through walls. More than that, I don't know. We're going to be like him. We're going to see him as he is. That makes everything you go through, all your past, all your hard memories, we've all got a few, right? We all got stories. We all have mistakes and failures. Perhaps yesterday you had a failure, a mistake. All the hurts that you've carried, all the dark temptations that pop into your head out of nowhere, all the battles that you've been through, 
are incomparable with what is coming. Paul talks about this, and it's time to prepare. We have to gird up the loins of our mind right up here and decide what we do with the 5% of conscious thoughts that we are aware of. Prepare with what you have control of and let God take care of the rest in your mind. You decide what you let into this precious thing that we call the mind. Feed it with the things of God as much as possible. Increase your appetite for his presence. You have to go into his presence, and it's a lot of work in our minds to get there. It's not like, boop, I'm there. No, you got to get through, okay, I got this stuff. I got to get, okay, that stop thinking about myself and go through all these nuances of thought, and, and, and you get into his presence, and then all of a sudden you're in the inner court. And you're in the holy of holies, which you have access to in your mind, not just in a church building anywhere. You don't even need music for it, but it helps. You have access to the holy of holies. It's in that place, time is gone. Even anguish and pain in your mind is gone, torment. Even for a lot of us, I've experienced it. In the holy of holies, my physical body is completely fine. It's the most amazing thing. We just get a taste of it now. It's a taste of heaven, what it's going to be like in the future. Increase your appetite for his word. We've, we can give you so many tools, church. We have Dwell. It's a great app. We have Bible. There's, there's everything. You can have all the things, and it's not going to force you to, to choose in your mind what you're going to do with it. Don't be deceived into forgetting who you really are in Christ this morning. In Colossians 3, uh, verse 1, and then I'm closing, guys. You can come up and get ready. Maybe, maybe it's a good verse for you to memorize. If you've been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So the greatest way to control your mind is Christ. And the fruit of it lies in eternity, not here. So you have to practice heavenly mind control. You can start this morning. Would you stand up? We're going to dismiss. We're going to close. Close with some worship. Now, worship is good because the way worship gets into your subconscious, that's not with any ulterior motive except to glorify God. So that's the cool thing about worship music. When it's glorifying God, I would hope it would be. And today the song talks about a new wine. Not the intoxication of the world. This is the Holy Spirit who we need to guide our thoughts and our minds. This morning, just close your eyes. Come on, everybody, close your eyes. Subtract your awareness of who's around you. Think of the thoughts that you've had lately. Think of the loss of appetite you've had for the things of God. Maybe some in here you've been struggling with some dark thoughts, some intrusive thoughts. Let me tell you, in all cases, medication may not be the answer. I'm not saying it isn't. I'm not saying there aren't real things wrong with people mentally. Perhaps it's the Spirit of God that has you here in this service, even though you did consciously choose to come, but he has you here to touch your mind this morning. Now, I can't say that all your negative thoughts are going to go away, but he's given you the power to handle them. So if that's you this morning and you say, yeah, you know what, I've been struggling with my thought life, and uh, my appetite for the things of God is way on the down low right now because my mind's a mess. If that's you this morning, just, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Come on. Come on. Come on. 
Thank you, Father. Lord, I pray over every, you can put your hands down. I pray over every mind in this place, Lord. Lord, the things we can't control, you are in control of, Father. And you have a new spirit, your Bible says, to put in us a new heart, a new mind, Lord. So I pray you help us, God, in power and authority, even as we sing this last song, that we would prepare our minds for action outside of here, that we would not be drunk on the things of the world, and that we would fix our hope that you've given us on you, Lord. In Jesus' name, touch minds and hearts in this place. Just go ahead and worship this morning.